that over. Give me okay. a second. Sure. Here's off calendar now. Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to this second webinar of the Pint Size Science Series. We're going to be talking today about some modules in the first grouping. Before we get to those, though, um, we've had some really interesting questions, and I thought that the answers would be beneficial for everyone to hear. Um, the link for the webinar from October 18th, I've got up here. It is a YouTube video, and it is ready to go now. So if you did not receive that in your email, um, you can let me know. Um, we'll take a shot here of my PowerPoint and you can write that down um, here in just a moment. Uh, by now, you should have all received your totes of materials. I'm getting lots of emails about that everything is in there or I'm missing something. Just let me know what those things are. If you are missing something, we will send those to you with the activity cards. I have had a lot of questions about when they're coming. They are getting finalized at the printer. As soon as we have them back, then we will get them in the mail to you. Any missing items that you let me know about will also be coming along with those activity cards. Um, the thunder drums and the cardboard construction, for those of you who got tiny tinkers, the thunder drums order has been canceled, so you won't be receiving that as part of your tinkers kit. The cardboard construction is somewhere between here and Sweden, probably on a boat. Um, and so as soon as it gets here, we'll be sending that along as well. Um, I've had some questions about caring for the worm farms. Um, on the Uncle Jim's website, I did print out their fax page. And one of the things that um, I had been asked about is what do you do when your worm farm starts to smell? And the question must be very uh, popular because they do have an answer for you. It says that if uh, you are getting an unpleasant odor from your worm farm, it's probably because you have too much compost material in there. They suggest taking out any extra food um, maybe putting some new soil in there, mixing it up, and then be able to kind of start all over again. We did learn at the Science Center just a few weeks ago that apple core is not the best item to put in your worm farm. We had an infestation of mites in our worm farm because one evidently was on the core. Uh, our animal uh, caretakers said that because the mite was there and it had all this liquid, it, the mites were just able to generate as fast as they could, faster than the worms even. And so they were actually feeding on the worms. He suggested that you don't put apple core in there. Now, apple peelings, banana peelings, orange peelings, things like that that don't have a lot of moisture content will be okay for your worms. But if you're seeing that it's starting to have a smell or it's being um, too wet, then it probably will need some new soil. Uncle Jim also suggests that if your soil is wet to make sure your drainage holes are clear. Um, be careful about how much you water them. They do drown. They also are not happy when the air temperature is 84 degrees or above. They do need a cooler environment to, to live in and to be um, uh, as successful and happy as you want them to be so that they can reproduce. If you have other questions, um, go right on to Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, and they do have a fax page that um, was very helpful to um, share with you. Um, it also was saying that um, if you find a lot of dead worms, you should find out the cause. It could be the heat, could be too much compost material. You do want to bury your compost material about an inch under the soil surface. Our animal caretaker also suggested that you put newspaper on top that would keep the moisture in there. It would absorb extra moisture and it would keep that um, animal or that worm farm habitat dark and cool so that they will, they will prosper as, as they should. So if you have any other problems with your worm farm, 
Uh, go on to Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, um, just Google that name, and they will have lots of um, other advice. I will tell you their customer service is awesome to work with. So if you do have concerns and you receive the Fascinating Farmers Kit, I would suggest that you call them and they will be happy to talk through any problems that you have. The next one that I have on here is the activity cards. We've already talked about those. We will send those along as soon as we have them. Tonight, because you don't have your activity cards, I've got them listed, what the name of the activity is, what the focus of that activity is, and the vocabulary, guiding questions, and the main concepts that you'll see on your activity cards when you get them. I thought it would be helpful for you to get started with your materials and then you would have at least these ideas to refer to until your cards do come. I've had a question about whether or not you can order extra lab coats for your students. The answer to that is yes. Um, Jolie says that the bigger our order, the better the price. So if you are interested in ordering more children's size lab coats, let us know how many you would like, what sizes you would like, and how many of each size. Then if uh, we uh, get um, a, a lot of people interested, then we will certainly go ahead and put an order in for you, and we will arrange um, a shipment uh, container to get sent to you with those extra lab coats. So that is a possibility. I also had a question about do we get certificates for this if we don't uh, take it for credit, either for licensure renewal or for graduate credit. And yes, you can get a certificate for this to put in your professional development folder so that you do have um, proof that you have gone through the, the trainings and the webinars and uh, that you are an awardee for 2018. I had a question about the SD card for the microscope. Someone was saying that the micro, the, the small one, wasn't big enough to fit into the slot. You do need to put that mini SD card into the adapter and then put that into your microscope. That way you've got, it's, it will take the place of any space that's in there. You can just pull it out and then put that into your, into your computer to bring those pictures up. I've also had questions about the resource page. We will be giving out names and passwords for that so that you can go on there and look up in, uh, more information or supporting ideas for your kits and ideas that you might be able to use once uh, you get really going with your materials. So those are the main questions I've had um, in the recent past and I thought it was interesting maybe everyone would, be benefit, would benefit from that. Okay, so this course for credit, um, you will have to register through the statewide AEA professional learning registration system. Then you will select your AEA, um, the course, and you will then just kind of follow that um, process to get signed up through the AEA for either licensure renewal or the, the uh, graduate credit through Drake. If you have any questions or problems with that, do let me know. I can give you more information on a personal level um, should that happen. But do go into the statewide AEA professional learning registration system first and then walk through the steps. So tonight, as I said, we're going to take a look at those first three modules. This includes bits and bots, colorful chemistry, and tiny tinkers. I did have an email today that said that she wished that she would have chosen um, another kit, but a colleague of hers has it, so they've already made plans to share and exchange ideas, and that's why we like these webinars, because even if you didn't get bits and bots, you might have a friend or a colleague that does, and being able to walk through it is an easy way and um, maybe will help you feel more confident when you present it to your students. So we're going to start with the bits and bots first. And so the main concepts uh, that the bits and bots module focuses on um, talks about coding as a way to communicate and that robots are programmed, that we have to tell them what to do. They don't know how to do this by themselves. 
And that pro programming is really making a pattern, giving it a symbol and a sequence. So those are those main ideas that as your students are exploring the bits and bots materials that you're going to talk with them about and make sure that they have an understanding about that. I'm not going to read through all of the vocabulary tonight because you are all very intelligent and these will be on your activity cards. But on the screen you can see some of the vocabulary that you'll want to infuse into your lessons and into your activities with the children so that they kind of start talking like a programmer and that they can understand what input is versus what output is. Um, or what programming is, or why is observation important when you're programming. Uh, the book that you're going to get, as we talked about in, in the first webinar, is the Grace Hopper Queen of Coding. And this is a great book to be able to talk with students about um, her frustration, because back in her day, she was doing binary code, ones and zeros. And it occurred to her one day that it could be done a lot simpler. Robots can't talk to us, but we could talk to robots or to computers. And so this is a true story, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but she was really um, forefront in the computer world about how to talk vocabulary to your computer. So in your activity cards when they come under the bits and bots, on the uh, left side you're going to see the titles. Those are, uh, you'll have five activity cards with the bits and bots. And then on the right side you'll see the guiding um, questions. And that is, you know what, I made a mistake. Those are for, those are, that is for uh, chemistry, I apologize. The, the guiding questions for bits and bots are things like, what do robots do? How do they, um, how do they take what we tell them to do and perform that sequence? Um, how do you uh, communicate with a robot? And so those things are things that you would talk about with your students. Um, of course, you're going to want to see what their foundational knowledge is of, of robots and then build on that. And by using the materials in the kit, you'll be able to get that, um, any misconceptions ironed out. So the first one was, who is Grace Hopper? Grace Hopper, as I said, um, was a re revolutionary even for her time, possibly even for our time. Um, she was uh, very instrumental in how we write code today. The activity focuses on letting students be the computer, so they go through a series of commands, and they, are, uh, they then will perform those commands much like a robot or a computer would do by us typing something in for them. The difference between sprout and seedling levels with a Grace Hopper activity is that sprout level students can play Simon Says. So Simon Says is you do what I ask you to do. You're listening for me not to say Simon Says, and but they're following your commands. The, uh, the uh, seedling level students can play the Boolean game, which is much like Simon Says. It's just done in uh, computer code. And the Boolean game w is based on a series of yes, no questions. So all the students can play together. You ask them a yes, no question, and that's their command. So if their answer is yes, then you give them command. If their answer is no, they stay where they are. Then if you want to, as the kids are getting older and they can retain more directions at a time, you could maybe give them three, four, five directions at a time and they would have to then, okay, if it's yes, I'll move, if it's no, I won't, and then process through that, much like a computer has to do, although they do it quite quickly, but the kids will get the idea of what the computer does when we type in the code. The next one um, activity is called Input Output Go, and it's similar to what you would do after reading about Grace Hopper, uh, but you want to infuse the words programmer and bot into this, bot short for robot. 
the bot is only going to respond um, when someone is clapping their hands. The programmer is going to clap their hands to make the bot move and stop to make the bot stop. So if the, if the programmer is clapping quickly, the robot's going to move quickly. If they're clapping slowly, they're going to go slow. And then if they stop, then they're going to be able just to not move at all. The, e the easiest way to do this so kids are, you know, uh, all going in the same direction is to put lines on the floor with tape or um, some type of a string, and then they are going to march or, or do the commands along that string. A lot of vocabulary, especially computer vocabulary, can be used and experienced by the students. Um, the Sprout level students, you would probably, especially preschool age, you would want to use just one command at a time. Uh, but the seedlings, however your children are, you know, whatever you feel like their ability is, you could do many inputs and get them to move at, uh, during many commands. Okay, so the next one would be my robot. And you're going to use the cubelets for this. And the, the secret to this is make sure that your cubelet is fully charged. And so in your cubelets, you'll have six. And I'm actually going to have Jolie talk to you about this. She has more experience with these, and she can kind of tell you some ins and outs about how to use the cubelets to get kids to start figuring out program code. Thank you, Lori. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cubelets and how cubelets work. Um, and they are based on magnetic attraction that allows these cubes to be put together. And we teach it as a way to be coding through tactile or through hands-on application. So to begin, you need to know that the dark blue or the slate blue cube is your battery cube. And you charge here, there's a, a micro um, USB port here, that's where you charge it and you can plug it in to a USB port or um, your computer or something like that to charge it and then you turn it on and green light turns on. Again, really important to make sure it stays charged. Um, we charge them maybe once a week um, and use them often based on that. So the charge lasts for a pretty good, pretty long amount of time. So that's your first thing. The second thing you need in your code is some kind of input or an if statement. And that is what the black cubes are for. So the black cubes, Cubelets calls these sensory cubes. We call them uh, input cubes or if statements. This one with the two circles, this is a distance sensor. So it's able to register how close something is when it's within a certain distance. The other one is a light sensing cube. So it can sense the amount of light that is around it. So it's saying if there is light, if something is within a certain distance. The last step in writing your code is a then statement or an action. The clear cubes are your action cubes or your then statements. So this one has rollers on it. So it will allow the robot to move and to roll. It only, the rollers only go in one direction. So if you want your robot to turn, you have to actually pick it up and turn it and then have the rollers move in that direction. The other then or output cube is a light. So then the light turns on. The way that you can teach coding to students is to say, for example, if there is something, turn it back on, if there is something near, then turn on the light. Okay, so I, it probably wasn't a good choice because you can't see the light very well. <laughs> How about if I put the rollers on? Okay, so if something is close, then move the rollers. And what's really great is it doesn't matter in which orientation you put these three cubes. As long as three, three, these three components are in your code, the robot will still work. But it's a great opportunity to experiment with the students or let the students experiment. What if you have two if questions? What if you have distance and light? How does the then respond to that? What if you have two outputs and only one input or one if statement? Do the then statements respond equally to it? 
There is a sixth cube that you get in your kit and it is green, a light green cube. This is a passive cube and it allows the message to pass through it. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't change the code, but it's used for things like balance or ballast. If you're trying to um, build your robot um, to move, sometimes balance is a, a struggle because it'll topple over. So this cube can be added to balance it out and doesn't affect the signal or the code as it's going through. The other two pieces that you get are magnetic adapters for Legos. So you can attach them to your robot and now you can add Legos, Duplos or regular Legos onto here and build to your robot beyond that. Okay, so that's the basic way and all sets of cubelets work together. So if you happen to be at a school and more than one of you got bits and bots, you can put your cubelets together. Or if you check out cubelets from your AEA or from your STEM hub, you could put them together. They all work together. Just make sure you know which ones are yours so you can get those back at the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And I will let you know that cubelets come in uh, boxes of 12. Jolie gives them to some of the Making STEM Connection um, participants who choose the cubelets kit. Um, there was, just, what, 24 maybe mm -hmm. in, in yours. And so if you are interested in building your cubelet uh, library, as it were, then there is an, a, a possibility for you to build, uh, to add on to that. So um, that is what your cubelets are able to do. And the focus of this is to get kids to think in those if-then statements. If I want it to have, do this, then I'm going to need to do this. And it, it starts that creative thinking and it starts that inquiry. Well, it didn't work, so what do I need to do differently? which is what we talked about at training we want students to be doing. So that was my robot. Uh, the next one is Hello Bluebot, and we did have these at training. Um, the, you'll have two of these, of course. Um, on, the back, or on the bottom side, there is a power button and there is a sound button. So if the sound gets to be too much for your room, you can always uh, silence it. This is um, uh, very, very basic. Uh, I was working or playing around with it last night and, and I was uh, mystified about how simple it really is. So on the top, you have a, a turn right, turn left, go forward, go backward. And those are the basic buttons. Uh, down here, after a student has put their code in, then you can hit the X to clear it and start again. And the two uh, parallel lines, that means to pause. So you can put a pause in your sequence and the bot will respond accordingly. The, the command cards that you get with them um, are very simple as well. So kids, younger kids especially, could lay down a card, a sequence of cards, and then touch the buttons in that sequence, and then it will go. So for instance, if we do, let me just get a couple here and we'll play around with it here. Okay, so um, I have a forward card and then a right card and another right card and then a back card. So I could lay those down and then I would be able to program my bot. So first is forward, so you would hit it one time, right one time, another right, and then back one time. Then when you're ready for it to go, you push go. and then it'll let you know when it has reached the end of your sequence. Now for older students, they may not need these cards. They might benefit from using your obstacle cards. So there are some flower cards, some bug spray cards, uh, some beehive cards, and we would suggest that you either use, uh, do tape on the floor, do a grid of of tape stripes on the floor to make them about uh, 15 centimeters 
long and wide. You can also use the car the command cards as your uh, ruler and make them to fit that. And then the bot is going, it, it's a visual for kids to know that this box is one command, the next box is another command, and so forth, and it's a visual. You, the older students might enjoy on your mat uh, using some of the obstacle cards and figuring out how to work around the obstacle cards to get from point A to point B. So that is BlueBot, and um, we used to have uh, some um, mats that we would give with the bots, but then when they got rolled up, they would cause little bumps and the bot didn't want to go over them. So anything that you can make your grid on a flat surface would be the way to go. And then you can maybe have it laminated and just pull it out for the times that you would need it. It does come also with a USB cord. There is um, just a little uh, thing on the bottom and you would just plug the other end into a USB port. Um, the eyes uh, will turn red when it's charging and they'll turn green when it's done charging. So that's a good way for you to know that it's ready to be pulled out and, and used by the children. Um, and so always, again, make sure it's charged. Um, nothing is more frustrating to kids than to get halfway through an activity and then they don't have the, they don't have the uh, materials to support it. So then um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was the robots turtle game. Um, if you were at the training in Des Moines, the very last one, um, a few teachers uh, pulled this out and I sensed a little frustration because A, they didn't have a lot of time to figure this out, um, but B, um, they um, must not have known because it was the first time and there's nothing wrong with that, um, that there are several levels to this game. It's as open-ended as you want it to be. I found that the booklet is very helpful. The, st the deck of cards, there's four colors of cards, and they suggest um, that the first game that you play, you only use um, the blue card that has a forward arrow, the yellow stripe here that has the turn left, and the purple card, that means turn right. So they suggest that you just take those cards out of each colored deck, put the rest of them away, and then when students get familiar and more comfortable with playing, then they can um, move on to the other uh, games in the booklet that uses uh, some obstacles like a brick wall, uh, a melting brick wall that turns into a puddle, um, or there's also there are, uh, some baskets in here. Where did those go? Oh, here we go. Some crates. And the booklet is very helpful in letting you know what's uh, good to do and what's, what kids can't do. Um, and it talks about turtle masters and turtle movers. So the masters are the players. Up to four kids can play this. The turtle mover is either an older child or an adult. The turtle mover acts as the computer. So the kids will figure out their sequence by using their cards, left, right, and forward, and they will figure out how to get their jewels. The jewels will be in the center of the, of the playing um, mat, and then they've got to figure out how to maneuver to get into their jewel. Um, the, the game is intended not to be very competitive. Everybody wins. It's just a matter of the, the programs that you write to get to your jewel. Um, then as the kids get more familiar with playing the game, then you can add some of these obstacles. Um, you can do... Um, uh, unlockables uh, is the next level they suggest, and that's the ice walls, um, the stone walls, and the crates. 
And then you could move on to writing your own program. So kids, as whatever level they are, they're going to be able to play this game to their ability. It's, uh, and you don't want to um, start out at the highest level with students until you're sure that they're comfortable and that they understand how to program their turtle to get where they want it to go. The other, um, the other suggestion in the book is that the turtle mover um, make noises when they're moving the turtles uh, based on the program that the kids are writing. Um, it makes it a little more interactive. It makes it a little bit more fun. Um, as you know, kids sometimes, the, especially younger ones, um, it's hard to wait their turn and it's hard for them to uh, be patient. But what you want to encourage them to do is to be thinking ahead. So as one person is moving or uh, writing their program, they need to be thinking ahead because if there are some of those obstacles in, on the uh, playing mat, then they have to figure out what their next step is going to be to work around that. So the, other, the only other thing in your uh, bits and bots kit was your um, How to Code a Sandcastle. That is really, uh, I think, a good level book for Sprouts. It's, uh, it happens at the beach, uh, which is, you know, always fun. And the girl in here is wanting to build a sandcastle, but she's wanting her robot to help her so it's not as much work. That's where the title comes from. And so she learns quickly that she can't just tell her robot, go get some sand. She has to put it out in steps so that the robot will understand what it is that she means and what is it that uh, the robot is supposed to do to, um, to respond to those commands. So it's, it is a fun book, um, very much on the point. It talks a lot about how to break a big problem down into a small set of problems so that you can write code for each of those small problems add them together, and then you've, you've got the answer to your problem. So it's a great book. Uh, I think kids of all ages were going to like that. Okay, so going on to the next one, it's Colorful Chemistry. And if you have gotten, uh, looked through all of your materials, you see that it's just a lot of um, home staples, household staples. Um, because some of the things that uh, are in there um, really do provide um, some really interesting investigations by kids. Um, and the main concepts, as you see here, are um, talking a lot about solids, liquids, and gases. And they're also talking about how adding heat or energy will make something hotter. If you take that energy away or you take that heat away, it's going to get colder. And so through some of these materials, you're going to be able to compare some of those hot and cold items and some of the solid liquids and gases. Uh, vocabulary um, is, is very, uh, I think we have two pages of vocabulary for this module. Um, and you want to start learn or working with your students to use these words when they are describing something or if they're uh, trying to communicate with you about what they are doing. Well, is it a solid, liquid, is a gas? And you want to talk about the states of matter. Being a solid, liquid, or gas is a state of matter. Um, some of the states of matter can be reversed and some of them can't. And through your investigations, children will hopefully be able to come up with a list of possible uh, reversible states of matter and, and not. And then they can investigate that and to see if they were uh, correct in their prediction. Um, you're going to talk with them about melting and evaporation and um, uh, freezing and a change of state. Um, so it, I'd like to draw your attention to that change of state. Um, physical changes are reversible. So that would uh, be those things that do, don't really affect um, the makeup or properties of an object. Uh, melting, evaporation, and freezing 
are all changes of state. So you're taking an ice cube and you're melting it, you're changing its state. If that water evaporates, you're changing it into a gas. All right, so here are the titles of uh, the activity cards that you're going to be receiving. Um, we talk a little bit about how ice transforms into water, how water transforms into ice, so kids can make that connection that those things are reversible. Uh, too hot, too cold, color changing milk, Alka-Seltzer rockets, which is the uh, investigation we did at training, uh, the water jelly crystals, and the goo worms. And then as I'm getting some of those things out, you can look and see that there are uh, some guiding questions, again, about what temperature does, uh, how that energy will affect the, um, the material that you're using, water or milk or whatever it is. And um, we did provide you an ice cube tray. So in the first couple of, of uh, activities, uh, you'll want to make sure that your ice cubes are frozen, um, as many as you think you're going to need, and uh, have those ready before the activity begins. And then um, your hot plate and your gloves um, are going to be very important, not only to teach the students about safety when they're handling really hot or really cold items, but to also get them into that scientific mode where uh, they are wearing their lab coats, they're wearing their goggles, and they are using um, safety as, as a major um, focus for some of these activities. So we're going to look first at this uh, water that transforms into ice. Uh, the focus of the activity, again, is to introduce that concept of what energy does, what heat does. and. Um, you, you as an adult, and maybe even your students will know that if you add heat to the ice, it's going to melt. Um, if you take that away, it's going to freeze. Um, so the, obs the observations of that ice and water is going to be able to demonstrate how energy affects states of matter. Um, the, the hot plate, uh, make sure that that is okay for you to use in your room. And uh, if not, maybe um, another place in the building would be uh, better suited for you to use a hot plate if it's prohibited in your room. Uh, the beakers, the infrared thermometer, and the metal thermometers from the spout, Sprouts Kit are going to be useful in this activity um, because you're go the kids can time how fast it melts. The uh, younger kids um, maybe could help read the numbers on the thermometer, uh, especially the metal ones. And you're going to be able, with the younger sprouts, to build on the vocabulary. How does the ice feel? Um, and they could watch the ice melt. Um, maybe in a beaker from the sprouts kit, you could uh, maybe have uh, tape or a marker that you could uh, start just making a, a notation of when the ice begins to melt. It's here, it goes up to here, it goes up to here, and time it. See how long it takes for that to all melt, how much water is in two ice cubes or four ice cubes, um, and make comparisons that way. Do, does the ice uh, melt faster in the window? Does it melt faster heating it up on the hot plate? Does it melt faster sitting on a desk? Um, all different kinds of ways that you can encourage kids to think of how can we melt the ice. This one too is, is the reversal of that as well and, and you're going to use the, the ice cube uh, as a, a lot throughout your, your chemistry um, experimentation. Okay, so this one, um, the spill trays or the lunch trays, someone called it in an email, that's the same thing, um, you're, you will want to bring out for this one. Um, you'll also want to use your two books, Jojo the Wizard and the Solids, Liquids, and Gases. Jojo the Wizard is uh, more appropriate for... Um, your um, seedlings or older sprouts, um, it's, a, it's a little bit more wordy and it is um, 
a little bit more uh, involved than just the solid liquids and gases book. Um, I think that would be much more appropriate for your um, your uh, sprout level students. Here it is. All right, so here is solids, liquids, and gases. And it's much simpler text, uh, big pictures, um, very easy for kids to, to see what's going on in, in, the, in the pictures. It still uses those vocabulary words of matter, solid, liquid, gas, but in a way that sprout level students can understand it. The next one is too hot or too cold. This one you're going to use your ice packs from the Science Sprouts kit. You're going to want one frozen and one heated in a microwave. Again, use your gloves so that uh, there's not going to be any harm to you or the students. And the, the activity focuses on the concept of what temperature is. Um, and have kids talk about that. What do they think the temperature of something is? Um, kids can use the thermometers to record freezing points, boiling points. Uh, they can use the pipettes um, to drop water onto the hot uh, uh, heat pad and the frozen one and compare the results. Does the water react the same when the, when the cold pack is cold and the hot pack is hot? Um, both sprouts and seedlings would be doing very well with this investigation. Um, it actually would be good uh, small motor development for sprouts to be pinching those pipettes and um, learning how to control the water as they come out. Um, and then of course seedlings can come up with a lot of different ways of uh, <clears throat> talking about freezing compared to boiling. The next uh, activity you're going to use your dry milk and you're going to use, <coughs> pardon me, you're going to use the soap and the food coloring. So in this activity, you're going to uh, help the kids see what happens when you're adding liquids. The soap is going to react a lot differently to the milk than the uh, food coloring will. And so by using some uh, Q-tips, uh, you're going to have the kids investigate what happens when they put the food coloring in the milk and the, the, put the dish soap in the milk. Um, this is a really good one to ask them what's going to happen and have them do predictions because um, it's, uh, it's an activity that I don't think a lot of students have uh, prior knowledge about. And so um, do, uh, working into those predictions questions or prediction I wonder statements would be able uh, to have something for them to investigate and to record the data um, for what they see. Uh, this one, if you came to training, is um, pretty, uh, pretty easy to do. For those of you who didn't uh, come outside and do the Alka-Seltzer rockets, this is um, what happens when an Alka-Seltzer tablet, which is a solid, is uh, added to a liquid, which it, we use water initially. Um, the key to this, I think, especially for Sprout students, would be for them to watch an Alka-Seltzer tablet first. Um, it's probably something that they, again, don't have a lot of prior knowledge about. Um, and so dissolving it and letting them watch the reaction um, will help them to kind of understand what's going on inside of the film canister. Uh, for those of you who didn't come outside, uh, you, what you do with this is you take the film canister, you fill it with about a third uh, of the way with water, you put a quarter of an Alka-Seltzer tablet in, you shake it up, you turn it upside down on the spill tray, and then you step back. And so the same fizzing action that happens when you put it in a cup of water it builds the pressure inside and it will lift off of the spill tray and come off of the lid on the film canister. Um, there's a lot of background science that Jolie has added to these activity cards so that you, if you have students or uh, that ask, well, how did that happen? Uh, the background science on all of these activities will give you some really good 
information that you could share with your students or maybe even you yourself understand a little better about how this is working and what's really going on with these chemical reactions. Uh, the next one is the water jelly crystals and that's the big bag that looks like little pebbles. And um, the water jelly crystals, interestingly enough, um, the Jolie put in her background science and so I put it on my, my uh, PowerPoint that one pound of these crystals can absorb 25 gallons of water. So they're, they start out like little rocks and by the time you add water to them, they swell up and um, they have a completely different composition than they did when they were dry. They are non-toxic, but again, I would uh, encourage you to watch the students to make sure they don't put them in their mouth. Um, I don't want them to have a choking hazard. Um, the seedlings uh, for this activity, they could use your food scale and maybe use your measuring cups and scoop out, say, a quarter cup of dry tablets um, and put it on the scale, see how much it weighs. After they've absorbed the water, maybe use that same quarter cup to scoop up uh, the water-filled ones, weigh those, and then compare. And maybe they could even do some calculation about how much water they might have absorbed. Uh, it's a good sensory experience for all kids. They, they, I've used them before and, and the kids just like the feel of them. Um, I've put them in my sensory table. Um, I've used them uh, for small group activities. Um, and actually when you're done, you can put them out to dry and they'll shrink right back up and you can use them again at a later date. So uh, you, you can have these around for a very long time. The goo worms, um, some people were having trouble finding them in their kits, but it's this white box that says um, Steve Spangler um, Fun on it. And um, the, the, again, this is a good prediction activity. Um, you'll have these, um, these crystals here, and there are um, directions on there. It says add one teaspoon to eight ounces of water. And um, then you have a big bottle of goo. And so uh, this is, again, adding a liquid to a liquid, but it doesn't result in what most kids will think will happen because this looks like a paint jar. And you want to really understand what's, uh, or what the kids think is going to happen. Get them to predict if we put this into the beaker of salt water, which is basically what this causes to, it to turn into, then what do you think is going to happen? And you're provided with an ultraviolet light, and so you might, uh, you know, use that as the next step in your investigation. What happens when we use this on what happens? I'll tell you that what will happen is when you add the the large bottle into the salt water, it will instantly, or what seems like instantly, turn into a rubber worm. And so they can scoop it out and they can feel it and um, you can do some measurement. So of course, the more that you put in here in a stream, the longer your worm will be. Um, ask questions like, well, can we put it back in there? Will it grow more? Or uh, is that a reversible um, state of matter. What can we, you know, and have them start talking about that and do some experimentation with it. I, uh, you know, go right ahead. Um, quick thing, I'll just peek in here real quick. Um, word of advice. First of all, this bottle is very heavy. So if you are having young learners take this and squeeze it into the salt solution, First of all, it's heavy. Second of all, they're going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, and you're going to get an <laughs> awesome worm that is really, really long. So piece of advice of something that uh, we have done in the past is using eyedroppers. So the, the pipettes that you get for science sprouts, you could put some of this into a small container, use the pipettes to draw up some of this liquid, and then they could each individually squeeze that into the solution. And you could have multiple worms formed in the solution at the same time. You can also experiment with what the worms will look like depending on how you squeeze or what kind of stream 
of liquid you pour into the um, solution. You could do it in little drops and you'll get circles or spheres. You could do it in one long stream. You can change the speed of it and add texture to the worm. So there's lots of ways they can experiment. But if you, if you um, separate some of this out into a container that's already been measured, then they won't use it all in one shot and then you don't have any of the <laughs> worm solution left. Learned that one the hard way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what teaching is all mm -hmm. about. You live and you learn and then you change it up a little. So that will be lots of good fun for kids, but it'll also be a great way to observe that change in that liquid as it goes into the salt water solution. I did have a teacher email me today and she was saying, and this might be a good suggestion if you haven't already thought of it, um, some of this stuff is it's be a good idea to maybe experiment with it uh, before or after school or even at home and just kind of have your own observation of what's happening. And so uh, you'll maybe kind of even uh, get ahead of the kids about what they might be uh, commenting on or maybe the questions that they will ask and then you'll be prepared to answer those. Okay, Tiny Tinkers is our last um, uh, section that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this is uh, mainly focusing on um, sounds and lights and uh, what tinkering really is. The, um, the items that come in this kit, um, I had a, a teacher email me today and she goes, oh that's what the aluminum foil cling wrap and the, the parchment paper is for. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, here are some vocabulary words that you're going to see on your cards. Um, reflection and volume and pitch and vibration and sound. Uh, your books that you got uh, with this kit. Um, you have the sound book and a light book. And then you have the one that says too much glue, <laughs> which has one of, become one of my favorites. Um, and so you, these would be great uh, seeds to plant on that flower framework that we talked about at training. Um, read it and get kids input. You know, what do they know about sound and light and um, glue? Um, and so the guiding questions for this is, how can things be seen in the dark? And how is sound made? And how can tools be used to make things that we need? So those are those questions that you might always be thinking about as you're going through these activities. So the first one, what makes sound? So for this, you get the palm pipes, which are in this, in this big bag. And to, to make sound out of these, you hit them against your palm, i.e. palm pipes. And as you can imagine, the longer ones make a deeper sound and the shorter ones make a higher sound. The other thing that you got in your kit was the boom whackers and these you actually will hit against a surface and again because they're all different heights you're going to get a different sound from the longer ones the middle ones and the shorter ones than you will from any of the others so for this uh, the, the the basic idea in how sound is made with these two materials is that the air inside of them is being compressed. And so with less compression, you get less vibration, and that will happen in a shorter tube. Um, or I'm sorry, the shorter tube is where you're gonna have more compression and more vibration because it's not as much area. The longer ones you're gonna get um, less compression and it's gonna be less vibration. Um, and so inside of these tubes, the amount of particles that are vibrating is what causes the volume. So um, the speed at which they vibrate is called the pitch. So um, if, you're, if you're using a small one, it's going to be a higher pitch because the compression in there is greater. 
And so by using these two materials um, and also your tuning forks, because they are different lengths, there's four different lengths of tuning forks, uh, kids can experiment with um, the, the uh, connection between the length of one of the materials to the sound that it makes. And I think that a, a great idea after they've had time to experiment with them for a while is to use them maybe to make a song, to, to play music with them. And so that they maybe choose a favorite song of theirs and then they figure out which one sounds closest to the note that I need. Um, it's almost like playing bells in, for adults. And have them compose um, a song with some of these instruments. The tuning forks are going to let them see the vibration so that they understand that it, it travels in waves. And so when you're hitting it against something, you're going to be able to see that vibration. Um, the palm pipes and the, the boom whackers, unfortunately, they might feel a little vibration, but they're not going to really get to see it like they will with the tuning forks. Again, the, the background science on this is very explanatory and it'll help you to understand what's going on as the kids are experimenting with these items. Uh, the next one, what makes sound different? So as they've experimented with these items, they've identified the fact that uh, they all make a different sound based on their length and how big around they are. And this is a good idea, or this is a good activity for them uh, to compare sounds of instruments. Um, they can design an instrument uh, on paper and then use the foil, use the uh, parchment paper, use the cling wrap, uh, use found objects um, to make uh, an instrument. And then talk with them about how does their instrument cause vibration? Um, can their instrument make different sounds? Um, and is the pitch or volume higher or lower than their friend's instrument? So th there's all different possibilities for this one. Um, and depending on uh, the amount of materials that you have available um, will help determine you know, the quality of their finished product. The more found objects you have, the better. The light uh, words activity, um, basically the focus of this is just to get kids to understand that light is a form of energy that we can see. Um, and so whatever you use to make light, whether it's a candle or a campfire, light bulbs, energy is being produced. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't hear it, but the energy is being produced. Now, um, at, during the first webinar, I told you that the flashlights had a little secret. So if you uh, unscrew, if you click it, click it, click it, and it doesn't turn on, just unscrew the end where the, the handle is, and then there's a little piece of plastic in there that says remove before using. And if you take that out and then just screw the top back on, then your light is going to turn on. So it's to help keep the battery charged until it's ready to be used. And um, so I would do that prior to letting kids use them as well. The book Light is All Around is a good, uh, is a good resource for this activity. Um, uh, seedling level students, if you're talking about what light looks like and what uh, light maybe feels like, what light is, um, then they can use those words to combine them into maybe a haiku poem or uh, a poem about what it makes them feel like when it's light outside. Uh, sprout level students can draw pictures of things that make light and then teachers can write down their dictation that describes uh, what their picture is about. And then, you, of course, pull in any of those vocabulary words um, on the uh, beginning of the activity cards that will help them um, make connections between what the vocabulary is and what they're experiencing. This one is called How Can We Change Light? Um, so you'll have in your kit the, the, flat, or the uh, mirrors, 
uh, you can use the flashlights, you can use um, found objects, cellophane paper, the cellophane paper, uh, the light paddles. These have a, a protective coating on them that you peel off, if I can get it started here. And then it's much more reflective after you get that off of there. So um, students, this is almost like um, uh, directing light. They can um, use the color paddles. They can use anything in your kit to make um, the light change. It can change colors. Um, it could change um, direction. Um, you can bring in the, the words refraction and reflection. Um, and then with the um, aluminum foil and the cling wrap and the parchment paper, you can bring in words like opaque and reflection uh, and um, transparent. And kids can use lights, sources, either the flashlights or uh, light bulbs to um, experiment with those three types of materials and see what light does when it's shown on or through those materials. Uh, for this one, seedling level students could compare the results with each other. What's the similar properties of things that light can pass through and similar properties of things that reflect light? And sprout level students, um, again, share their observations. Maybe they want to create a class chart about light, um, things that they know are uh, sources of light, or things that they've experienced where light is concerned. The last one um, is really going to get your kids thinking. It's the illumination maze. And by using objects, whatever they desire, the goal of this is to build a maze that is going to um, bring a source of light and you want kids to think, how can I change that direction of that light source? So maybe you want them to figure out how to bring the light from outside inside. Or maybe you want to be able to have them uh, figure out how to divert light so that maybe it hits the series of mirrors that you've got maybe set up in the room. Um, this activity is really a higher level thinking activity, so it really is more appropriate for seedlings. But I think Sprouts would enjoy being able to maybe make a mirror by covering a piece of cardboard with the aluminum foil and then comparing what their made mirror does in, co in um, connection to the mirror in the kit. Um, they can uh, experiment with uh, shining a light on the mirror and moving that mirror around to where the light is bouncing off the wall or the ceiling or the floor, uh, the desk, um, anything that you can think of. So um, to conclude tonight, um, the author of the book, if Tiny in t the Tiny Tinkers uh, Kit, The uh, Making and Tinkering with STEM, uh, I have uh, found a podcast uh, that she uh, was um, part of that she talks about the maker spaces in early childhood. We kind of think of maker spaces as being something that older kids do. They get to tinker and, you know, build all these wonderful creative things, but younger kids can do that as well. Um, and so we're going to listen to this podcast and um, jot down any ideas that might be helpful to you. And again, in the recorded version, um, you're going to be able to listen to it again. So this is Kate Harriman the author of Making and Tinkering with STEM. BAM Radio Network. The teacher could have easily gotten that little car out, but she said, you know, that's a problem. How are we going to solve it? Oh, well, yay. the children went straight to that maker space and they began experimenting. Welcome to Student Centricity, Practical Strategies for Teaching with Students at the Center. I'm Ray Pika. 
Have you been hearing the phrase makerspaces lately? Or maybe the phrase you're hearing is making and tinkering. Seems it's all the rage in early childhood education these days. But is it something new or something that's always been done in the classrooms of young children, but just has been given a new name? Here to tell us what makerspaces are all about is Kate Harriman. Hi, Kate. Thanks for joining me here. So, Kate, what exactly is a makerspace? And is the concept new or just the name? It might be a little bit of a twist to it, a more modern modern twist to it. It's a place where people gather to tinker, to make things, to invent, to create, uh, to explore, to put things together, to take things apart. And it's a a lot about um, using real materials and real tools um, to solve problems. So a lot of it, it's it's great for early childhood. It's at the intersection of what we do already. Okay, so real materials and real tools. Because when you were describing a place to gather, to tinker and make things, I was thinking about, you know, Legos and blocks. But then you talk about real materials and tools to solve problems. So give us an example of what that looks like. Oh, in that makerspace, it could have consumables, found materials, um, cardboard, uh, uh, scissors, fabrics, textiles, things for making, all kinds of things. But you also have things to connect things with. If you're putting things together, tape, uh, even low temp glue guns, uh, hmm. yes, that are that are safe for young children to use, and we teach them how to use these tools. Yeah. So it's um, all those kinds of things could be in a maker space. I think it's great to give them that responsibility. So, what kinds of problems are they solving then? It, anything. I was at a, a a classroom, and the children dropped a a little metal car between the loft and a wall. And the teacher could have easily gotten that little car (laughs) out, but she said, you know, that's a problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, the children went straight to that maker space and they began experimenting. They tried all kinds of things and they ended up with a string with a magnet that they dropped down there and to find it. So it's at that intersection between art, technology, science, and it's all putting it together to solve problems. And another thing, uh, it can start with literature. In children's books, there's usually a character who has a problem to be solved. So that children's books could be a springboard for problems to be solved. Okay, well, you're just running right ahead and answering questions I haven't asked yet, so, <laughs> but that's that's okay. So I, I know that making and tinkering, uh, they're most often associated with STEM. So you know, give us uh, another example or so about how they relate to one another. About STEM, of course. Uh, well, that's the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and there's always usually an element of art in it. In my book, Making and Tinkering with STEM, we have design challenges that focus on some engineering design challenges. Uh, One of the ones is a a, a pet carrier, and it starts with a book about uh, a rescue puppy. And children have to, are encouraged to invent um, some way to get the res- uh, a rescue animal back to the shelter. So they have to make and tinker and figure out how, how that structure that they're building, that carrier, will support a puppy. What kinds of things does, does that pet need to survive? Does he need exercise? Uh, they might invent a toy for the, the pet. They might write a letter. They might check in to the the shelter. So there's all kinds of ways to integrate all of these things. Sometimes uh, people think of STEM in isolation, each as separate subjects. But what the, uh, you know, that we're going to teach science and now we're going to teach technology and now we're going to do engineering and math. But with a makerspace, it brings it all together in a meaningful way for children. And so it's an integration of all of these uh, areas. Yeah, I love the deeper thinking that's going on. It's it's fabulous. So you mentioned um, jumping off points, books as jumping off points. So that obviously is a way that it promotes learning, connecting literacy. Besides the, the books, you, you also mentioned writing something. Just give us some examples of how it can connect to emergent literacy as well. Well, I mean, just vocabulary, Ah. (laughs) vocabulary. What is a rescue puppy? Learning language, having conversations, thinking aloud, 
making a plan, drawing a picture, um, writing to a, a resource person to learn more about it. Um, it's all of those kinds of things that that will fold into it. Yeah, that's fabulous. I mean, the learning in the, all of the content areas should definitely be integrated. So how about social studies or social emotional development? How can makerspaces contribute to those? Oh, that, I mean, if you think about being in a makerspace, having to share materials, mm. to collaborate with a friend, you might need somebody to help you do something. How to control your emotions and cope with frustration. I mean, uh, one time I saw a child trying to um, connect a paper towel roll to a paper plate and oh. was, you know and you watch and you step back and you observe and when they're just on that brink of frustration you you step in and you show them a strategy you know let's see if we can snip the ends of that paper towel roll to glue it down or to make it stick better so you know knowing how to manage all of those feelings and emotions and knowing that Failure is not a bad thing that mm. we, that everybody makes mistakes and it's an opportunity to learn. Think, think about the inventors and how many trials they went through before they invented anything. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and even in the social studies area, you're learning about people's jobs and, and how they use things and, um, how people um, live and invent and all of those kinds of sure. wonderful yeah. things. Yes. It must be very tempting for a teacher to jump in before the child reaches that it edge is. of frustration. It is. I think, that, and it, it's tough for me too. So you, it, you're so, it's so tempting just to say, let me show you how to do it. Yeah. Or, or, and to make things easier. But you really have to step back and watch and observe and then give them that hint that gently nudges them to help them find that answer um, yeah. and let them struggle and grapple with it a little bit more. Uh, yeah. And that's what problem solving is about. Absolutely. And they're not doing enough of that in education today. Yeah. <laughs> so um, very briefly, it, it's a separate space in the room. And, and if a, a teacher is new to the concept, how would she or he begin? Well, I think, it begins with a, having that mindset for making and tinkering and looking for opportunities. And I think, you know, this making and tinkering can happen anywhere in the classroom, indoors and out. But it's really nice to have that hub or that space where children can find materials and use them, that the choices are clear, that they're displayed attractively. You know, some teachers who don't have space may have a little mobile cart with those materials on it that can move around. Um, I've seen some schools have a, a little alcove in their hallway that they create a maker space there. Uh, we, some teachers put out invitations to tinker by having something called a tinkering tray, which could be a cutlery tray with little found objects in it that invite that making and tinkering. So it can happen anywhere. Some yeah, schools lots even of have possibilities. a, yeah, they have a dedicated room, another maker space that children can go to. So there's lots okay. of po possibilities there. So, Kate, considering that many of today's early childhood classrooms have become a place for academics, accountability, and more and more sitting, um, <laughs> how do makerspaces find a place? You know, not not a, a, a literal place, but how, right. you know, how do they fit into these kinds of programs? I think you need to look at your curriculum of what you're doing, what topics you're studying. I don't if you're using a thematic approach or if you're using a project-based approach and look for possibilities of how you can integrate this into what you're already doing. It's not something that you have to add on. It's just looking for those possibilities and being open to that within the curriculum that you're already doing. There's lots of opportunities for it. Yeah, if we can think beyond the worksheets, then- Amen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here and talking about makerspaces with us on Student Centricity.
Young children are experiential learners who acquire information through all of their senses, which is why I fight so hard for active learning as opposed to rote memorization and worksheets. The kind of learning experiences Kate described here are not only active but authentic. There's real learning taking place here through all the senses and across domains and content areas that will stay with the children forever. Even if they don't specifically recall how best to glue a paper towel roll to a paper plate, the lessons they acquire from the satisfaction of solving problems and overcoming mistakes will be far more invaluable in life than anything they can memorize. This has been Ray Pico with Student Centricity, offering practical strategies for teaching with students at the center. Thank you for listening. This program is produced by Accretive Media for the. Okay, so. Um, Ray Pika is one of my favorite early, favorite early childhood uh, specialists. Um, she has just some real practical experience. Um, she is a fighter for um, the hands-on learning, and um, she is a, a speaker and, and is uh, quite knowledgeable. Um, while you were listening to that, Jolie and I brought out a few more of the chemistry items that we thought that you would um, kind of enjoy seeing. Um, the the um, test tubes that you get, um, anything that requires liquids, um, could th these would be very useful in that. They do have lids so that if... Uh, you know, you have to leave your experiment or, or children um, want to shake something up. Uh, it's, it's a great way to, to save on the mess. Um, the other thing we for, wanted to talk about is your color fizzers tablets. Um, and um, Jolie says that these will give a much truer color than your uh, food coloring does. Um, they're more concentrated. So if you're wanting to use the color fizzer tablets to uh, change the color of something, uh, then this would be the way to go. Now your food coloring, you can add to your watercolor crystals and you can make different colors of watercolor crystals. So maybe kids want to investigate um, the number of drops of blue to the number of drops of yellow and, and make a collection of that color and then uh, combine some other color of the food colorings um, to make different colors of the water jelly crystals. Um, the other thing that uh, we wanted to show you was your, um, your color paddle. And on here, so the clear ones, uh, there's one that when you look through it, it causes a kaleidoscope. So it would be really interesting for kids. No, there it is. So it, it causes a kaleidoscope effect. So I think kids would be amazed at what that does. Um, of course, you've got different colors that you can talk about color mixing, um, what happens when um, two colors are mixed together. So they're very vibrant. Whoop, wrong way. There we go. And so in that, in that investigation where you're tra trying to change light, uh, the color paddle would be a great way for kids to experiment with the color of light. And so you see how vibrant those colors are. Oops, if I can move it the right way. All right, so again, kids can add two or three, four panels together and um, experiment with m mixing colors. Um, you also have an opaque one that is much like your parchment, your parchment paper where the light goes through, but it's dulled. It's different coming on the other side of the light paddle than it is when it hits it. So you can talk about that that is, is very opaque. It shines through, but it's just not clear. So the color paddle is a great way to change those, that light that, in that investigation. There's also other ways that you can do it. Um, and the cellophane was one way that I mentioned. Um, maybe you want to have the children um, cut the cellophane into different size squares, cover your flashlights with it, um, 
and, and kind of do some experimentation with uh, the color of light, just like the, with the, the color paddles. There's several sheets in here, and so this should last you quite a while um, for any experiments or investigations that you'd like to do um, for that. Uh, on the front, it also has some artwork that you might want to replicate or have kids come up uh, with different ways of using this for the A of STEM um, to make steam and then use them as window coverings or uh, mobiles from the ceiling. Um, lots of different ways to use the cellophane sheets. Jolie, do you have some other ideas? Oh, sure. Um, so what Lori shared with you today are the lessons that we um, developed to go along with these materials for Pint Size Science. But what we hope is that's not the only thing you use these materials for. We spent a lot of time researching these materials. We wanted to find things um, as the podcast was suggesting that are real and authentic um, for students to use, but also that you can find other uses and purposes for. So I'd love to show you one example that is kind of messy but kind of exciting, <laughs> and it uses the sound tube. So okay. you, if you got Tiny Tinkers, you should have gotten two of these sound tubes, um, and maybe you've seen them before, and what they are generally used for is um, you swing them, and it produces a sound. And you can experiment with the speed of how fast <laughs> they go and the sound that you get, which is really exciting for students to experiment with. There's a huge amount of science that goes with that that they don't have to know and understand, but they can certainly learn through authentic play and understand that the sound changes based on how fast the tube moves. Now, if you've ever lived, or if you've lived in Iowa for some time, you probably have some experience or understanding with tornadoes. This same tube can be used to help to understand how tornadoes work and how destructive they are. It's another way that you can use the tool. So what you would do for this is you would have uh, your tornado tube and some confetti or paper. So all I did is I just tore up some little pieces of paper here on the table. And uh, what happens in a tornado, and if you got the mini meteorologist um, module, then you got the tornado tubes, which is something that you can focus on here too. You could use this to help you to learn about how tornadoes work. But uh, in a tornado, the reason that a tornado is so destructive is that air is moving from a place of high pressure to a place of low pressure. That's always how things move, from high to low. And the greater the difference in the pressure, the faster the air moves. And the reason that the air has these different pressures has to do with temperature and has to do with speed of the way the tornado is moving which again is more science than maybe the students really need to understand. But here's a really cool demonstration. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this end of the tube, that's kind of the bigger end where you would normally hold it, okay, like a handle, and I'm gonna hold it right above my little pieces of paper, and then I'm gonna swing the top part. And what will happen is that this top part is moving faster, so it has lower pressure than the bottom part, and the air will move from high to low. So basically, we're creating a vacuum. It's the same way that the vacuum cleaner that you use in your house or in your classroom works. So I'm going to demonstrate it, and I don't know how well it'll show on the camera, but basically what's going to happen is these little pieces of paper are going to get sucked up through the tube, and then they're going to fly out the top. Okay? So here we go. Here's the super scientific technique. Did you see it? Did you see it go through there? Isn't that cool? So um, you can experiment with that and see... Um, what about the sizes of pieces? How do they move? How fast do you need to use the tube? So even though this is designed to help you to understand sound, you can use it in lots of different ways. And we really encourage you to look at this tote that you've gotten with all of these things and not only think about the, the lessons that we are providing you, but other ways that you could use some of those materials. Very good. Okay. Yes. She showed that at the office when we a few weeks ago, and it was it was really cool. So, um, 
again, safety is an issue with those. You want to make sure that there's plenty of room between the students swinging it and their friends. Uh, you don't want to cause injury with it because if they're getting very fast spinning it, then that's going to cause uh, quite, a, quite a scar. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and get on the chat. Uh, Jolie is manning that tonight. And if there's anything that uh, you think that would be a good question for everybody to um, hear and get the answer for, uh, we'll be happy to answer that here tonight. Um, if you have any comments, any aha moments, uh, go ahead and share those in the chat room as well. We'll be happy to to talk about those uh, here tonight. So while you're uh, working on that part, um, this is a, a chart of what we'll do next time. Our next webinar is going to be on December the 6th, and we're going to talk about the second group of uh, modules, and that will be the classifying creatures, the many meteorologists, and the homes and the habitats um, kits. So we'll talk also about the inquiry method. Again, kind of revisit that, uh, what we learned uh, in summer training, and uh, how to link that to using the materials uh, in any of the kits. Uh, but just to give you kind of a refresher on what inquiry-based learning is. So here is what is next. Again, uh, we have uh, a, a, a webinar on the 6th and then another one on the 20th of December. We do encourage you to send us uh, uh, pictures and photos. You can either do it through the Pint Size Science Facebook page. Uh, you can um, do it through an email to me or Jolie. You can also uh, do it through Twitter. Uh, Jolie is a, has a Twitter account. She can retweet those to uh, your hub managers, uh, your districts, uh, anything like that. And, uh, and I do want to just take a, a minute here. I have had a couple of teachers uh, contact me that because you are so excited about the the uh, presentations, uh, the webinars, the materials, the, the trainings, uh, that they are also wanting information about how to sign up for next year. So thank you for that. Your excitement uh, is infectious. Uh, these other teachers want to get in on it. Um, I hope that we'll know, uh, the Science Center will know early uh, winter, uh, whether we were chosen to present this again um, next year. We are not the only uh, business in the state that pro pro uh, provides uh, scale-up training. So we are hoping that we do get the chance to present this again. So if you do have colleagues that weren't able to join us this summer, do pass the word. Uh, they would report right to the hub manager that you submitted your application to. And um, even though the hub manager may not have specifics, that person could give some general uh, ideas about deadlines and how to go through the application process so that your, your teacher colleagues could also benefit from this type of, of materials and trainings. Um, as far as your inventory sheets, if you are missing anything, or even if you're not, we want to hear from you too if everything that you expected uh, came. Uh, give me an email so that I can make a record of that. Um, and also, if you happen to have something extra that's not supposed to be in there, let me know that too, and we'll uh, make arrangements uh, to get those back from you. Um, could be very possible that another teacher is waiting for it. So uh, let us know if, you, if everything's there or, again, if something is missing or extra. Anybody that has a question or anything yet, Jolie? No. no okay. I think we're doing good. All right. Well, that concludes this second webinar for Pint Size Science. Uh, do let me know if I can be a support to you in any way. If you have questions or comments or you would like another idea, 
please let me know and I'll do my very best to get back to you in a timely manner um, and give you the support that you need. That's what we want to become to you across the state is a teacher support and another resource that you can go to should you have questions or uh, you encounter obstacles and you don't know what to do. So good night and I hope to see you next time on Pint Size Science webinar.